Hello and welcome. We are having a press briefing today about the double asteroid redirection test mission. I am Karen Fox with the Office of Communications. We are sitting here at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and we're going to be talking about this mission, which we call DART. DART is going to make impact this Monday evening with a small asteroid called Dimorphos, which is circling around a bigger asteroid called Didymos. Neither of these asteroids are headed towards Earth, but we are testing to see if you can make impact with an asteroid and change its trajectory in case we ever do find an asteroid headed towards Earth. We have five panelists with us today to talk about DART and answer questions about what is coming up, and we will then take questions. So our panelists are Kate Calvin, who is the Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor here at NASA Headquarters. We have Lindley Johnson, Planetary Defense Officer at NASA. Tom Statler, the DART Program Scientist here at NASA Headquarters also. Ed Reynolds, DART Project Manager at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Laurel, Maryland. And Lena Adams, DART Mission Systems Engineer, also at APL. They're each gonna give a little bit of a presentation and talk to you for starters. We will then take questions both from those people in the room as well as media on the phone lines. So with that, let's get started. I'm handing it off to you, Kate. Thank you, Karen. So I am, um, as NASA's senior climate advisor, I'm deeply invested in the future of planet Earth. And that includes planetary defense, which is how NASA works to ensure our planet is protected from potential asteroid and comet hazards. We're looking at asteroids to make sure that we don't find ourselves in their path. We also study asteroids to uh, learn more about the formation and history of our solar system. Every time we see an asteroid, we're catching a glimpse of a fossil of the early solar system. These remnants uh, are show us the history and, uh, and capture a time when planets like Earth were forming. Asteroids and other small bodies also delivered water and other ingredients of life to Earth as it was maturing. So we're studying these to learn more about the history of our solar system. Asteroid impacts have also had profound effects on the Earth. Uh, so they've changed the ecosystems and led to the extinction of species. The dinosaurs didn't have a space program to help them know what was coming, but we do. And so DART represents an important progress in, um, in understanding how to uh, poten avoid potential hazards in the future and how to protect our planet from potential impacts. Back to you, Karen. Thank you so much, Kate. We will move to Lindley Johnson, who is our Planetary Defense Officer here at NASA. Thanks, Karen. Uh, yes, we in the Planetary Defense Coordination Office here at NASA are really excited to be here uh, looking at this uh, event uh, by DART uh, on Monday. Uh, this is an uh, exciting time, uh, not only for the agency, uh, but uh, in space history and in the history of uh, humankind, quite frankly, uh, the first time that uh, we uh, were able to demonstrate that we have not only the knowledge of the hazard uh, posed by these asteroids and comets that are left over from the formation of the solar system, but also have the technology that uh, we could deflect one uh, from a course uh, inbound to uh, impact the Earth. So this. Uh, demonstration uh, is extremely important uh, to our future uh, here on the Earth and uh, uh, life uh, on Earth. Now, the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, uh, of course, undertakes more activities than just uh, this, these flight missions. Our first and, and most important task is uh, finding what's out there. We've got to know what's out there, what its position is, and uh, where they are going into the future to determine if there is a future hazard of impact uh, to the Earth. Uh, so uh, that is uh, our, our, our primary task, and a lot of our effort is in that area. We also have to understand the nature of these objects, uh, what their sizes uh, and compositions are, and uh, their orbital path uh, to determine uh, when in the future they might uh, pose a hazard. Uh, Didymos itself and its moon Dimorphos uh, was actually found by an uh, early project of our Near Earth Object Observations Program back in uh, 1996. Uh, so we've known about this particular asteroid for some 25, 26 years now. Uh, but uh, uh, finding them, uh, determining uh, where they're going, uh, using uh, our planetary science uh, uh, aspects and 
uh, researchers to uh, learn more about them uh, is all a part of our overall program because uh, planetary defense, uh, frankly, is uh, applied planetary science. And uh, the two uh, have to work together uh, in this endeavor uh, to protect Earth from uh, a future impact. Thanks, Karen. All right, Lindley, thank you so much. We will move on to Tom Statler, one of the, our DART program scientists. Thanks, Karen. Good afternoon, everybody. As Karen said at the beginning, the double asteroid redirection test is a test. We're doing this test when we don't need to on an asteroid that isn't a danger, just in case we ever do need to and we discover an asteroid that is a danger. We're doing this test at a double asteroid, a binary asteroid, the larger asteroid Didymos being orbited by its smaller moon, Dimorphos. This is the perfect natural laboratory for this double test because there are two tests in DART. The first test is the test of our ability to build an autonomously guided spacecraft that will actually achieve the kinetic impact on the asteroid. The second test is the test of how the actual asteroid responds to the kinetic impact because at the end of the day, the real question is how effectively did we move the asteroid and can this technique of kinetic impact be used in the future if we ever needed to? So this uh, double asteroid is the perfect place for this test because from our point of view on Earth, we see Dimorphos crossing in front and behind and in front and behind of Didymos every orbit. That's observable telescopically, even though we can't see the two objects separately, we can see the total light from the pair dip just a little bit twice every time around the orbit. And that's how we know from telescopic observations that the orbit is 11 hours and 55 minutes and has been absolutely solid for probably thousands of years, if not longer. But our DART spacecraft is going to impact Dimorphos at a speed of 14,000 miles per hour, changing its speed by perhaps a percent or so, and changing the period of that orbit. Just like if you dropped your wristwatch and damaged it, it's not going to keep necessarily the same time anymore. We're expecting that, that clock, that orbit, to run just a little bit faster. And you might not notice it right away, but in the weeks and uh, days and weeks to follow, you would notice that your watch is running fast, and we will notice that the binary asteroid system is running fast. We'll be able to see this by using the same techniques, telescopes on Earth, observing this binary system for the weeks following the impact. And we'll have telescopes on every continent on the Earth observing the Didymos Dynam system. Not only that, we'll also have telescopes in space, the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope, and even our Lucy spacecraft will be observing the Didymos system close to the time of impact to see if we can see some brightening from the dust and debris ejected into space. And we also have, courtesy of the Italian Space Agency, the Leechia Cube CubeSat, which was deployed from the DART spacecraft on September 11th. Uh, Leechia Cube is flying on its own, controlled by the Italian Space Agency. Leechia Cube will follow DART about three minutes behind, also passed by Dimorphos at a safe distance of about 55 kilometers, and we're looking forward to successful images from the Leechia Cube spacecraft. But even with all of those observations, Dimorphos is a tiny asteroid. We've never seen it up close. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what the shape is. And that's just one of the things that leads to the technical challenges of, of, of DART. Hitting an asteroid is a tough thing to do. And you'll hear about that in a minute. I'll turn it back over to Karen. All right, thank you so much, Tom. Next up, we have Ed Reynolds, the DART project manager at APL. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we launched DART just almost 10 months ago, last November, and since then we've been working really hard for this moment. Um, we've been really focused on the, the overall spacecraft, getting it ready for impact, making sure that the ground systems are ready for, uh, for this to flow data during, during the impact day, and then also preparing the team to be ready for impact, and then any contingencies that could occur um, uh, during impact day. So we had a great launch. Um, we, we've launched out of Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, right around Thanksgiving, and um, we had a terrific trajectory that required very little correction maneuvering. And so in December, we went into one month of commissioning the spacecraft. And um, 
that went very smoothly. And what we can say at this point is that all subsystems on the spacecraft are, are green, they're, they're, they're healthy, they're performing very well. We have plenty of propellant and we have plenty of power. Um, after we commissioned the spacecraft, we started focusing on the bits and pieces of smart nav and just making sure that all those bits and pieces were in place so that on impact day, they all, they all work together. We have proven that they are all working and that they are ready for impact. And you're going to hear a little bit about that from, from Lena next. And so the spacecraft's doing great. Uh, the ground system, we've been, we've been streaming. We've been doing a bunch of tests where we've been when using the spacecraft, we've been streaming uh, Draco imagery at the one, the one image per second that you're going to see on impact day. And so this goes into uh, the rehearsals, um, just making sure that the ground system can handle that throughput and that we can do things like overlay uh, informative information that help us and help um, other viewers look at the, look at the the sequence as we're getting closer and closer and closer. And so it's, it's gonna be exciting. And then finally with the team, um, we've been doing a, a bunch of rehearsals and some of the rehearsals are very nominal, like this is what we expect on impact day. Um, but then we also get into the contingencies like, and we've been doing rehearsals where we introduce unknown contingencies to the team. And we watch their behavior, and we make sure that they are truly trained up to handle the nominal situation and, and then any contingencies that occur. So at this point, I can say that the team is ready, the ground systems are ready, and the spacecraft is, is healthy and on track uh, for an impact on Monday. So thank you. All right, and for our final speaker today, we have Lena Adams, the DART Mission Systems Engineer at APL. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about what you're going to see in the next few days from DART, and then also we'll harken back to what Tom was saying, which is it is really hard to hit a very little object in space, and we're going to do it. So um, over the next couple of days, we're actually still performing some trajectory correction maneuvers to make sure that we are on the right path to hit the asteroid. We're also going to be uh, putting parameters on board to make sure that we're really ready for terminal. Ed said we rehearsed a lot, and yes, we have. But as we go through the cruise phase, we update parameters on the spacecraft to make sure that we can actually hit the asteroid. And so in the last couple of days, we'll update those parameters. We'll do checks, like streaming images back to Earth. And, uh, you know, Tom mentioned that we did a lot of Draco imaging. We have over 200,000 images already on the ground from Draco. So we know it was, works really well. We have been able to detect the Didymos system. So we can see Didymos, the larger asteroid. We have not seen Dimorphos, and we really won't, not until about an hour prior to impact. But we can see the Didymos system. We see it really well, very clearly. That's actually what we're using right now to guide ourselves to, um, to the system. So in the, in the next few days, we'll take more images of the Didymos system. We'll do trajectory correction maneuvers. And then at 24 hours prior to impact, it's all hands on deck. We'll have people in the mock working overnight, trying to make sure that everything is set and ready to go. And at four hours prior to impact, the spacecraft becomes completely autonomous. What that means is that even though we do have a full mission operations center, where there are about at least 44 people all watching data coming down and telemetry streaming from the spacecraft, the spacecraft has to do everything. It starts with detecting Didymos, the larger asteroid. It starts tracking it. It's starting to guide itself towards Didymos. And then at about an hour prior to impact, and some models say, you know, 70 minutes, some other models say maybe 50 minutes or maybe even 40 minutes prior to impact, for the first time, it'll see just one pixel in the field of view of our camera, Draco, and that's going to be Dimorphos. And so at that point, this is when we switch from guiding towards Didymos to guiding ourselves into Dimorphos, we're going to execute a bunch of maneuvers all autonomously. The spacecraft points the solar rays at the sun, streams data back to Earth, basically video, one image per second. So on Earth, we'll be actually able to watch you know, us stopping to go towards Didymos, and now we're tracking this new asteroid, and that's our target. So then um, a little bit after that, we're going to precision lock 
and you'll hear us say that in the mock because all of this is going to be streamed on NASA TV. So you'll hear us say it, we're precision lock, which means we are now starting to ignore Didymos and we're going to demorphous. So, and then at two and a half minutes before impact, SmartNav, which is the autonomous algorithms that have brought us to that point, is going to turn off, and we're just going to point the camera and take the most amazing pictures of this asteroid that we're going to see for the first time, and we don't know what the shape is, and, and then impact. We'll all say loss of signal, and we'll celebrate. So I hope you're all out there. Back to you, Karen. Thank you so much. Uh, we will start taking questions. Uh, I plan to start in the room, so if those of you who wish to ask a question can make your way to the microphone, please do. Uh, if we don't have anyone, since I don't see anybody standing up and jumping at that opportunity, we will probably go to the lines uh, right away. But before we get there, I will say this, uh, that uh, Lena just mentioned that you can see it all on NASA TV. Uh, NASA.gov slash live is the place to watch that broadcast starting at 6 o'clock on Monday, September 26th. And we will also, if you navigate your way to the NASA TV media channel, be showing a, just that Draco imagery starting at 5.30, so just a live feed of that as well. Um, so with that, let us switch to the phone lines, please. First question comes from Marcia Dunn from Associated Press. Your line is open. Yes, hello. Um, one quick question and one other one. I, is there any uh, possibility of manual intervention if the autonomous navigation isn't doing what it's supposed to do? Can ground controllers jump in and uh, ride it to the right asteroid, for instance? And, and I'm wondering also, perhaps for Mr. Johnson, um, what other tricks might be up scientists' mission, mission planners' sleeve for deflecting or um, deflecting an asteroid, besides impact, what, what are some other methods that are under review, if not by NASA, by others around the world? Thanks. So we'll start with Lena Adams, and then we'll move on to Lindley Johnson. All right, this is Lena Adams, and uh, yes, of course, uh, so the whole point of having people in the Mission Operations Center at that point is to be able to intervene if necessary. The, uh, the, the one-way light time to be able to send a command to the spacecraft is only 38 seconds. So we have 21 contingencies that we plan for that we're ready to execute in case uh, something like that comes up. For example, you know, the most simple one is that if we're seeing that Dimorphos is too dim in our field of view of our camera and we wanted to increase the exposure time. Other ones do involve basically saying this asteroid is not the right one and uh, please switch over and start guiding yourself to the right asteroid because we do have that video feed back to the ground. So yeah, we plan for all these things and we're ready to intervene and we have been rehearsing this for quite some time. Lindley? Yeah, Lindley Johnson, the Planetary Defense Officer. Uh, yes, uh, DART is demonstrating what we call the kinetic impact technique uh, for uh, changing the speed of an asteroid in space and therefore changing its orbit. Uh, but other concepts have been uh, uh, studied. Uh, we have uh, a list of three or four that uh, in the future we'd like uh, to test. Uh, this demonstration uh, will uh, uh, start to add tools to our toolbox of, of uh, methods that could be used uh, in the future. And we need uh, several of them because the circumstances uh, that we might face uh, could be quite different uh, and we need an assortment of tools uh, depending on the scenario, how uh, far into the future uh, have we uh, predicted this impact, uh, what is the size of the asteroid that we need to deal with, uh, uh, what is the uh, orbit uh, that it's in, because uh, some orbits are, are a lot tougher to get to than, uh, than others uh, from the Earth. So we need to build up a toolbox of different techniques. Uh, some of the other things that have been uh, studied uh, are what we call a gravity tractor, uh, which is just taking a, uh, a, a spacecraft and uh, station keeping uh, with the asteroid and using nature's tug rope uh, gravity. Uh, the mutual attraction between the spacecraft and the asteroid will slowly tug that asteroid um, uh, out of its uh, 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 impacting trajectory into a, a more benign one. 
Uh, of course, a technique like that takes uh, longer to implement, so we would have to have more warning time uh, to be able to, to implement it. Uh, uh, other techniques, uh, ion beam deflection, just uh, shooting an ion engine at it for a long period of time, and slowly all those particles impacting the surface also change its velocity and, and therefore its orbit. Uh, so uh, basically any technique that you can imagine that changes the speed, the orbital speed of the asteroid uh, in orbit uh, is a viable technique. And, and so we work uh, with uh, our colleagues, uh, both in the other uh, agencies within the U.S. government and uh, internationally, uh, to uh, talk about these concepts and techniques and, and how we can collaborate to uh, test them out. Uh, the uh, uh, forum has been set up, international forum set up, called the Space Planning uh, Mission, uh, uh, Space Mission Planning and Advisory Group, which is a forum for national space agencies. Uh, some 18 of them right now are involved in, uh, in the same page in looking at technologies and techniques uh, that could be used to, to deflect an asteroid. All right, thank you so much. We will take the next question, please. Next question from Gina Sansuri from ABC News. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Talk to me a little bit about what it takes to get video back from this impact. How complicated is that? Is that for you, Lena? Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I'd love to answer that question. And thank you for asking such a good technical question. So what it takes is a new type of antenna that we actually have on board uh, of the spacecraft. Uh, it takes a new type of avionics that we're uh, running through all our data. But what happens actually on the spacecraft is actually really fun. So we take an image of, uh, of the asteroid, and then we process it through our computer, which crops it, uh, then sends it over to the smart navigation system. Smart navigation system does a whole bunch of things with it to try to figure out where it's located in space. But at the same time, the image also gets cropped and then sent to Earth through our radio and then through our hard gain antenna and down to the deep space network. Uh, a set of dishes that are actually going to be looking at us. Uh, there, most of them are located in Australia, um, uh, just because we're kind of on the southern trajectory. But so we have a few dishes in Australia that both from the Deep Space Network and from the European, um, uh, the ESA track, the European Space Agency dishes that are going to be looking at us and making sure that they can get this data down. Um, so all of the processing happens in basically two and a half seconds. So each one of the images has about two and a half seconds latency that it gets uh, received on the ground, plus you know, uh, it takes 38 seconds to travel and five to eight seconds to process. So what you're seeing on the ground is something that is probably about 45 seconds late, but that is still amazing because an image is coming in every second. So yeah, it basically looks like video stream coming in. It took us a lot of testing <laughs> and practice. Thank you so much. We will take the next question, please. Next question is from Nell Greenfield Boyce from National Public Radio. Your line is open. Hey, thanks for doing this. So a question for Elena. Um, if you guys knit, can you come back around again and take another go at it? And a question for um, Lindley Johnson. Um, you know, a lot of what the public knows about this stuff comes from Hollywood. I'm just wondering if you personally have watched shows like Armageddon and Deep Impact and, like, sort of how the public should think about this test versus what they see, you know, in, in their sort of more cinematic depictions of asteroid uh, mitigation. Thank you. All right, so I'm sorry, I got sidetracked on the Armageddon part. <laughs> no, it's always si sidetracks you, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, let me handle the, the, the question. The question was, uh, what happens, uh, you know, if we uh, miss uh, what we call a missed approach? Uh, now, through all the testing that we've done, and, uh, and certainly what I've seen, uh, the uh, action uh, by uh, the APOL team on, on DART, uh, uh, I'm highly confident that uh, we are going to hit on Monday, and it will be a complete success. But if, uh, you know, there is a miss, uh, then the first thing we've got to do is uh, really figure out what happened. Why did we miss? Uh, so uh, that'll be the first uh, thing is to uh, uh, safe the spacecraft, uh, get uh, all the information down from the spacecraft so we understand uh, what occurred, and uh, uh, safe the spacecraft so that it's uh, ready uh, for 
uh, a future use. So that's, uh, that's what uh, will happen uh, in a mess, but I have every confidence that that's not gonna happen. Uh, as for uh, uh, the Hollywood uh, movies, yeah, uh, this uh, uh, situation, uh, asteroid impact, comet impact, uh, has uh, been a popular genre for science fiction books and, and movies uh, for a long time. It captures the uh, public imagination. Uh, but uh, that's all Hollywood and movies. They have to make it exciting and, uh, uh, you know, we find the asteroid only 18 days before it's going to impact and uh, everybody runs around with their hair on fire. Uh, that's not the way to do planetary defense. Uh, uh, as I said, the most important thing we have to do first is uh, find the population of the hazardous asteroids out there and that uh, is... Uh, a big part of what our uh, endeavor of Planetary Defense Coordination Office and our partners uh, uh, across the agencies and the international community is these uh, surveys uh, and uh, right now ground-based telescopes uh, that are searching every possible night and we're finding uh, about uh, 3,000 near-Earth asteroids of all sizes uh, every year and uh, we are about to cross the threshold of having found uh, 30,000 of these asteroids. Uh, and it's entirely, uh, uh, we have the technology now uh, to do this and find these objects uh, years, uh, decades, uh, even a century uh, before they pose an impact uh, threat to the Earth. And, there, and that uh, provides us plenty of time then uh, to uh, decide what is the best uh, technique uh, to prevent the impact. Uh, to uh, put the asteroid in a, a more uh, benign orbit uh, that, so that we don't uh, ever have to worry about that one anymore. Uh, so uh, first we've got to find uh, this entire population. Uh, we uh, are currently working with ground-based assets, but the real way to do this is to have a space-based telescope, uh, and we're working on that. It's called the NEO Surveyor mission. It is, in fact, having its preliminary design review this week. So this is a big week for planetary events uh, in our work uh, uh, here at NASA. Uh, and that uh, uh, telescope uh, will uh, operate in the infrared part of the spectrum where the asteroids uh, actually stand out uh, more from the background of stars. And we can also determine the sizes directly from those measurements and we don't have to take uh, weeks and months of uh, other uh, data on these objects to understand uh, what uh, uh, what we're uh, dealing with. So, uh, unfortunately, it's not the uh, exciting uh, Earth is going to end in two weeks uh, scenario. It's uh, uh, a very uh, uh, focused and uh, 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 gradual way of, of working through this, this whole um, uh, issue, understanding what's out there, uh, then uh, determining what you can do about it with tests uh, like DART, and then working with our uh, partners, uh, other uh, space agencies uh, around the world uh, to determine uh, what's the best uh, technique and, and uh, uh, what space agency is going to do what in this campaign uh, that would actually be undertaken to deflect an asteroid you know, in space should it become a real uh, problem. And I think Lena wanted to add something. Yeah, so uh, Lena, thank you for taking the first part. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to add is that I mentioned earlier the contingencies that we have on board. And um, that's actually one, uh, we have 21 contingencies. Number 21 is missed impact. And what will happen in case there wasn't a missed impact, you will see the team will just sit back down because you can imagine we'll all be anticipating and you know, in the last couple of minutes, we're all gonna be standing up waiting to see us hit an asteroid, but we're going to sit down back into our seats and we're going to start uh, preserving all the data on board about why we missed and we have uh, time with our deep space network right afterwards to be able to actually get all that data down. And then we'll start conserving propellant and we'll start looking for the objects to come back to. So that's the plan. All right, we will go on to the next question. Next question from Bill Harwood from CBS News. Your line is open. Hey, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yes, Bill. Okay, thanks, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, I recall a paper in Science, I think, uh, earlier in the summer 
about Osiris Rex and the sample collection process at Bennu, and the and the nature of the surface of that asteroid was such that I read somewhere you know if they hadn't fired their thrusters, they might well have just sunk right into the asteroid. It was so you know the rocks were so loosely bound. Um, I'm just it's probably apples and oranges, but just out of curiosity, if if a high speed object like Dart hit an asteroid like Bennu, a what would happen? And B, do you know that's not the case with Dimorphos? Um, I don't know enough about that asteroid to know if that's a dumb question or not. Thanks. Great. Tom Statler is going to take that one for us. Yeah, this is Tom Statler. Um, a lot of great questions in there and a lot of great questions that, that the DART investigation team has been working on for years to uh, study different materials and to bring to bear the, the cutting edge uh, computational simulation techniques that we have to be able to simulate what actually happens when a spacecraft hits an asteroid at 14,000 miles an hour. Um, and and our, our view of the range of possible outcomes has really been opened up by our experience with the OSIRIS-REx mission at Bennu and also by the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission at Ryugu, both of which found that the surface materials were, were almost fluid-like. There was so little friction and so little cohesion, they behaved, even though they were solid chunks, behaved almost, almost like a fluid. And so that, that does open up the range of possible outcomes. If the surface of the asteroid is very comparatively solid, we'll get a smaller crater. If it's as um, friction-free as Bennu seemed to be, we might get a very, very large crater or large pieces, you know, a large section of the asteroid being reshaped. And that's a big part of why we need to do the test, because every time we go to an asteroid, it's a surprise, it's a learning experience to us. We do not know exactly how these, how these asteroids will behave, because we don't have samples of real asteroids on the Earth. We have meteorites on Earth, but meteorites are just the strongest parts of asteroids that make it through the atmosphere and make it to the ground. And so really getting ground truth on how an asteroid behaves requires that we go to space to do the experiment. Now, for anything really, really surprising to happen, I mean, I as you said, the, uh, the tag sand, the sampler mechanism on OSIRIS-REx seemed to just keep going in to the surface of, of Bennu. But we know that DART is going to be stopped by Dimorphos. Uh, for one reason, the density of the DART spacecraft is actually not very different from the density of an asteroid. And so there's no question that DART is going to run into a whole lot of material that can't get out of the way. And so that is going to make it stop. So the scenario where it goes straight through, that's just not going to happen. Also, there are ways, uh, there are, are, are aspects in which we know Dimorphos, or at least we know Didymos, is not like Bennu. We're extrapolating and assuming for the moment that Dimorphos is similar to Didymos. But um, Didymos, for example, is a different composition. It's a different spectral type than uh, that Bennu. Bennu is a very dark, carbon-rich object. Dimorphos is, uh, has a reflectivity three times brighter than Bennu, so we know it's a different kind of object. It's also spinning very rapidly, and the dynamical studies show that, Dimorph that Didymos uh, has to be either higher density or more cohesive or both than Bennu. So a lot of things uh, could happen, but we really do not expect uh, Didymos or, or Dimorphos to be a carbon copy, literally, of, uh, of Bennu. And um, one thing I want to add, too, is that we're actually going to know the ground truth with the HERA mission arriving there in 2026, the European Space Agency mission that's going to be a follow-on to DART that is going to look at this crater and look at Dimorphos and really study the surface, and I think that'll be great for everyone. Great. We have more questions on the phone line, so I'm going to keep going back there, but I do want to, people in the room to know that if you want to stand up, I will call on you at the microphone if you decide you have a question to ask. For now, please, let's take the next question, question on the line. Thank you. Next is from Aileen Woodward from Wall Street Journal. Your line is open. Hi, thanks so much. Just a couple of clarifications. So once you've locked on to Dimorphos, if you need to make a course correction, are you utilizing the hydrogen propellant and are you utilizing those onboard thrusters? And then I just wanted to also clarify that basically a round trip communique from the spacecraft to Earth and back would take a little over a minute given that it's, it's 38 seconds one way, correct? 
a, a right to both. We're using our hydrazine thrusters to perform all maneuvers in terminal. Uh, we demonstrated our next sea thruster for a couple of hours uh, early on in the mission uh, that has been completed. Now we're using hydrazine only. So we have 12 hydrazine thrusters. That's what's actually going to be propelling us towards the asteroid. Um, and then uh, for the, your other question, that's right, 38 seconds. Uh, so multiply that by two, it's uh, over, you know, 70 seconds. So an, uh, over a minute uh, round trip light time. But what you're really looking for is the time that it's going to, the images are going to come back to Earth. And so there's a little bit, there's close to 10 seconds of processing, five to 10 seconds of processing on top of the 38 seconds of, um, of a just round trip light time. Sorry, one way light time. Oh, round trip, one way. So, um, Go ahead. Just to add, on impact day at the moment of impact, um, just so you, you, you're not confused, you're going to hear messaging that we've lost radio contact and there's still going to be images coming through and being displayed once per second for about eight seconds. And that's, those are, those are images that are traveling through space and um, you know, we, we, they've hit the ground, we, we've detected that we've lost radio contact but those images are still working their, themselves through the pipeline and being displayed. So when it, you know, we, we kind of have kind of some uh, guidance to the team that um, just so that no, no one's celebrating too early that we, we'll, we'll get that message of loss of contact and we'll still be seeing it. And we're, we're basically, you'll hear Lena will, will say impact and she may put other words around it, but, <laughs> but hopefully but, yes. <laughs> but that's that's where we have very high confidence that we did hit the asteroid, and that people can we can let the guard down on the mission operations center, and people can relax. Yeah, and of course you will also see the images of. Demorphous, extremely close up. Our last image is probably going to be from about two and a half seconds prior to impact. So the the Draco field of view is actually going to be completely filled with this beautiful image of Demorphous. I do need to add one thing to that since we're talking about that wonderful yeah. moment when impact will occur. The engineering team will be celebrating, yeah. and the astronomers at that moment will be saying, "Okay, time to get to work." That's true, that is very true. This mission has two parts. The first part is hitting the asteroid, the next part is actually measuring what happens afterwards, as Tom said earlier. So for those of you on the phone, uh, the first person who wasn't Lena who spoke was Ed Reynolds, and the second person was Tom Stotler, so you know who to attribute information to. Uh, with that, we will go to our next question, please. Next is from Dan Bergano from Grid News. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for the name and identifications. Uh, Dan Bergano on Grid News. Um, I'm wondering if uh, the impact happens and the morphous is diverted, that 1% factor you talked about, what does it tell you um, about how much lead time or how much distance from Earth you need to, to deflect an asteroid about its size, moving about as fast as it is from hitting the Earth? And, and sort of a code of that question is, uh, in terms of spotting those asteroids, what is the delay of NEO surveyor now to at least two years or or mean in terms of being able to spot these kind of things coming in. Thanks very much. Okay, this is uh, Lindley Johnson and Arctic, uh, th uh, those two. Uh, uh, as, as I said, uh, uh, it is very scenario dependent on uh, what the lead time uh, uh, is and would be needed uh, and depending on the uh, technique. <clears throat> as I uh, said that uh, any technique that changes the speed of the asteroid in its orbit about the sun is, uh, is a viable technique. Uh, it's just a question about how much uh, you make that change. Uh, so uh, a kinetic impactor uh, of uh, DART size, well, DART is uh, specifically sized to have the uh, desired effect on uh, Dimorphos, uh, which is this uh, small moon. Uh, if it, uh, we were faced with an asteroid uh, in uh, orbit about the sun uh, heading towards Earth, uh, it would depend on the size of the asteroid, uh, how much uh, we would need to uh, hit it with uh, uh, in the case of a kinetic impactor. 
Uh, it would probably need to be uh, larger uh, than DART. Uh, and uh, we also might uh, uh, hit it uh, with several kinetic impactors, uh, uh, each having its own uh, uh, you know, stepping uh, down the uh, uh, speed of the asteroid uh, to, uh, uh, to affect the change. Uh, uh, other techniques uh, might take longer or, or shorter, depending on the, on the size. So uh, that is all the kinds of things that need to be assessed once we are dealing with uh, an, actual, uh, an actual threat. Um, uh, the second uh, question you had was uh, with the uh, uh, budget uh, reduction uh, in the new uh, surveyor project. Uh, uh, currently, uh, uh, we have uh, a budget uh, that uh, is uh, over on the hill uh, for uh, uh, the appropriations. It will depend on uh, what Congress uh, does with that budget, of course. Uh, but that uh, budget will uh, allow us to launch not later than 2028 uh, with NEO Surveyor. Uh, that's uh, about a two-year delay than uh, what we were looking at earlier. but. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, time is somewhat on our side in this business. Uh, a asteroid impact is an extremely rare event. Uh, maybe uh, uh, once uh, a century, is there any asteroid that we would really uh, uh, worry about and want to deflect? And uh, only maybe once in a thousand years, uh, an asteroid the size of Dimorphos, uh, on average. Uh, but uh, the important thing is uh, to get the, the capability uh, up and, and find them. Uh, Neo Severe will be able to find uh, the population of asteroids uh, 140 meters and larger within about a 10 year period. And uh, that's, you know, a very short period uh, in geologic uh, time. Uh, and uh, unless we uh, happen to be you know, particularly unlucky, uh, that, uh, I'm not worried about an impact uh, in, in that kind of a in that kind of a time frame, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, we need to get uh, uh, done, and so that uh, we know what's out there and know what's coming, and and have uh, adequate time to prepare for it. All right, moving on to the next question. Next question from Brett Chingley from Space.com. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I'm wondering. In the course of the development of the SmartNav system and the trajectory correction systems, did you conduct any hardware testing, uh, like flight tests, so to speak, or was it all completely computational? Thanks. I think I'll take that one. <laughs> yes, we, we have done a lot of different flight tests. Uh, okay, first, of course, we've done a lot of testing on the ground because you shouldn't fly anything um, that you haven't tested on the ground. And we did a lot of testing on the ground with computer simulations. But once we launched, we actually have done quite a few tests where we were looking at stars and trying to fool the smart nav system that two stars right next to each other are Didymos and Dimorphos and tracking them. We conducted those tests. And then recently, and that's something that we published in the news recently, is that we've been watching the Jovian system, so Jupiter and its moons. And we actually watched Europa exit from behind Jupiter. And we fooled our smart nav that uh, Jupiter was Didymos and Europa was Dimorphos. And we actually watched the separation happen. And why that is important is because um, in the last four hours during our terminal phase, when the spacecraft is completely autonomous, we're going to watch Dimorphos emerge from behind Didymos. So we already trained the system to do this uh, in flight. So uh, we're looking forward to it. I uh, think we can do it. Thanks so much. Uh, continuing with the phone lines, next question, please. Next question from Jeff Faust from Space News. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Uh, a couple quick questions probably for Tom Statler. Um, you talk about getting uh, the measurement of the change in dimorphosis or orbit within days or weeks. Do you have a sort of a, a more specific estimate about how soon you might be able to know what the new orbit is? And then how quickly after the flyby do you expect to get images back from the Leechy Cube spacecraft? Thanks. Yeah, this is Tom. I'll take that. Um, 
so I'll, I'll do this in reverse order. So uh, Leachy Cube is uh, being controlled by Ozzy right now. Uh, they are uh, testing out their systems, and they will be taking images as fast as they can, storing them on board. The rate at which they're able to download their images depends on their exact state after the flyby. It depends on the availability of uh, the deep space network, and the deep space network uh, helps to communicate with and navigate with everything in deep space, and we have a lot of things in deep space, and we may have more things in deep space soon. But uh, Ozzy will be prioritizing uh, early download of the, the most, the, the images that have the best chance of showing us that we have a confirmed impact and the, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the ejecta plume from, from that impact. But the data rate will be fairly slow, and so I don't think we should be expecting more than um, a couple of images per day on average coming back from, from Leisha Cube. Um, now on the other question you were asking me to predict when we're gonna get the first ind indication of, um, of the orbit change, um, I think it's fair to say that different uh, parts of the investigation team have their own ideas about that and they're competing with each other. I think the optical observers and the radar observers have a friendly rivalry to see who's going to get it first. Uh, I don't want to get into the middle of that debate, but um, I, I think I, I, would be, I would be surprised if we had um, a firm measurement of the period change in less than a few days, and I would be really surprised if it took more than three weeks. But what that says is, again, we're doing the test because we want to understand how this asteroid is gonna react, and we really don't know until we do the experiment. Great, we will move on to the next question, please. Next question from Alexander Witsey from Nature Magazine. Your line is open. Hi, this is Fred Lindley. I want to follow up on the NEO surveyor question, if I could. Um, how much would NEO surveyor need to be allocated by Congress in this funding round to make it back onto a 2026 launch? So we do have um, basic information about that, Alex. So why don't I follow up with you offline, and I will get you what information we can, okay? okay. Thanks. Um, so, though I'll give you an opportunity to ask a different question right now if you want, since I know you've been in the queue. Um, no, my others have been taken. Thank you. Great, Alex. I'll follow up with you. Um, fantastic. Uh, let us go on to the next question then. Next question from Marcia Smith from SpacePolicyOnline.com. Your line is open. Thanks so much. I was wondering if someone could provide a little more detail on what you expect to see from Hubble, JWST, and Lucy. Uh, I think someone mentioned that you'd be looking for uh, images or some other spectra of the dust that might uh, come up from the impact, but what exactly are you looking for and what different wavelengths will each of these be looking at? I guess Hubble looks invisible and JWST in infrared, and what about Lucy? And uh, how far from JWST will DART be? Tom Staller. I can take some of that, but that's, uh, well, that's quite an oral exam you gave me. I'm not gonna remember all of those numbers, so I'll have to get that, uh, get that to you after the fact offline. So um, Hubble will be observing, so all, Hubble and JWST and Lucy will be observing starting before the impact to some number of hours, a varying number of hours after the impact. And I should back up one half step because of course, as I said, the most important observations are those that tell us the period change of, of Dimorphos. But observing what's going on just in the first few hours uh, after the impact, what we're looking for there is an overall brightening of the whole system indicating how much dust and other debris got kicked up because that ejecta goes into space and it is also lit up by the sun just increases the total amount of surface area of stuff that's shining in the sunlight. And just being able to measure how much that brightening happens and when does it happen is a measure of something about the consistency of the material that was, uh, that was lofted up and how much there was. So uh, all of these telescopes are going to be observing over that time. Um, Hubble, 
I am pretty sure is observing in the optical region of the spectrum. Hubble is going around the Earth, and so half of the time it's behind the Earth. So Hubble won't actually catch the exact moment of impact. That's okay, because we don't really expect anything to be really observable from the exact moment of impact. But uh, Hubble observations will start about uh, 15 minutes after the impact. JWST, because it has to readjust uh, periodically to pick up new guide stars, may not be observing again at the exact moment of impact, but will pick up just a few minutes afterward. And uh, Lucy will be observing from uh, roughly twice as far away as uh, the Earth is from Dart and, and Didymos from a different direction. Uh, Lucy will be observing with its LaLaurie imager, which is very similar to Draco, actually. And it's only a four-inch telescope, and so it will see a very, a very faint object uh, uh, brightening. LaLaurie is also an optical imager. JWST, I would have to go and check with my colleagues to find out exactly which instrument, which camera, uh, which wavelengths it's observing at. And I can follow up with you offline again and see what information we can get to you. But uh, for everybody, uh, if you check out nasa.gov slash DART, we are going to be updating as soon as we get imagery and we find out more about it, we'll be putting things up there. And it looks like Lena has a follow up. I, I was going to give a number, <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, we're going to be um, impacting Dimorphos at seven million miles from Earth. So you can imagine that JWST and Hubble are going to be in that vicinity in terms of the distances. Yeah, well, w JWST is at the L2 point, L2 which, points, is a, which is a, which a million point. miles yeah. out. So subtract a million miles and 5.8. Yeah, so here miles. you go. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we will take the next question, please. Next question is from Alicia Sowers from Mashable. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I think this is for Ed. I'm wondering in terms of Monday, um, what's your probability calculation for hitting or not hitting the target? I'm just trying to better understand how likely it is that it will hit Dimorphos. And then if you could indulge us, what part of the event leading up to the impact really concerns you the most? Um, and it's sort of like keeping you up at night as we get closer to it? Let me start the last question first. Uh, so what concerns me the most is the weekend. So there, there are 44 people in the mock, and they're all, you know, each one has a level of criticality. But and um, so, the, you know, as we, as we go into the weekend, uh, especially like, you know, Friday and, and Saturday, it's, it's like you just want the, the team to stay safe. And so we're, we're, we built we built DART in the middle of a pandemic. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so you, you just want to make sure people are not getting sick or having uh, family in distress with other, other issues. So uh, the thing that I would like to see, you know, Monday morning is we have a fully populated mock and everyone is, is healthy and well rested in the, and in the right frame of mind. Um, so with regard to prob you know, probability of hitting, um, we've been doing, since we've launched, you know, almost continuously we do mission simulations. And we, and we don't do them in a vacuum. We, we actually do a lot of measurements in space with the spacecraft. Like we, we point it to the, the exact attitude that we're gonna be in terminal. And, and we, we do, things like let's do a lot of thrusting just because we have big long solar arrays and let's see how they behave and and we collect that data and then we take that data and we and we fold it back into our models and we continue to do uh, mission simulations um, with the new data and refining it and Lena had talked about parameters and so a lot of these we don't do simulations just to do simulations. We do it to learn and to figure out what are the best parameters um, to have on the spacecraft as we begin. And as we, as we kind of, the, the dimorphous and didymos, well, dimorphous begins to reveal itself and, and how the algorithm behaves to what's, what's revealed, we're gonna get maybe some insight as to, hey, that looks like the mission sims that we did like three months ago. And, and so it, it's kind of a, a, a good place to, to really go and look at, you know, how, how everything's behaving and should we adjust a parameter. And um, so 
we're, you know, with all of this rehearsal and with all these measurements, we're in a very, very good place um, to do um, to do this um, Monday's Monday's event. Um, that said, you know, did him, you know, dimorphous is just oh, barely over a hundred meters in diameter. It's it's not very big. We're we're at fourteen thousand miles per hour. We're we're approaching something that we've never seen before. So, you know, so, you know, to quote the past, we we do things because they're hard. We are we're at the point where technology is emerging so that we can use these emerging technologies to protect ourselves against these threats. And so that's why the T in DART is is test. And so it's test and learn. And and I think we prepared ourselves for this moment. But I have I have. I don't worry about the spacecraft. I don't worry about the algorithm. They're not what keep me up at night. I, I, I worry about my team. I worry about my daughters. And so um, I think we're ready. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to try and get to as many questions as we can. And uh, we'll go to the next one, please. Next question is from Tim Fernholtz from Quartz. Your line is open. Oh, thank you, sorry, my question has been asked, thanks. So I think we can we'll move, move on next. then, but thank you. We'll move to the next question. Jake Robbins from the We Martians podcast. Your line is open. Hey there, thanks for taking the question. I'm just wondering about the AutoNav software. How much of that software was created brand new for DART, and how much of it is, is legacy software that maybe comes from some other missions? I don't know if it's New Horizons or something similar. I can answer that. Um, so uh, we actually created uh, the software uh, specifically for DART. It does not come from other missions. Uh, smart navigation is based on some of the algorithms that are used in the missile world, um, just because you know they're also interested in hitting small things in space. But um, this is uh, the first use in space, and we had to change a lot of things to actually make it flyable. Thanks so much, and on to the next question, please. The next question is from Kenneth Chang from New York Times. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, so now I've hit other things in space successfully with Deep Impact and Elva. So I was wondering, how much harder is this one? Is it a lot harder because you haven't seen um, Dimorphos yet? Oh, I'll take this one. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're spot on. It, it is extremely hard for multiple reasons. Deep Impact and uh, other missions, uh, they really are looking at the asteroid, the sizes of those asteroids are much, much larger than what we're going to be hitting with DART. We don't really know what the shape of the asteroid is. We don't see it until the last hour, and that point is just a pixel in the field of view. I mean, at three minutes prior to impact, two minutes prior to impact, it is 42 pixels in size. That is, uh, and you're moving extremely fast, and at that point, you cannot really send any commands in. So your system has to be very, very um, precise in how it's controlling the spacecraft, what information we're taking in from all the different sensors on the spacecraft, in addition to the telescope itself. Uh, so yeah, it's a little different. All right, we have four more questions we'll be taking. We may go a little past the hour, though we might try to be uh, quick on our answers if we can. Uh, going on to the next question. The next question is from Asia Farrington from KEB 9 News. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. So you mentioned that it could take anywhere from days to weeks to figure out if this mission is successful. If it is successful, are there any plans to build more DART spacecraft for future use or for even future tests for larger asteroids? This is Lindley. I'll, I'll take that. Um, uh, well, uh, for uh, the spacecraft part of the mission, uh, you know, we're no uh, immediately uh, if it's uh, successful because it uh, will have hit the asteroid. Uh, what uh, Tom was referring to er uh, earlier was the observations that have to be taken uh, to determine just how much effect it had on the orbit uh, of the asteroid, which could take uh, uh, days or weeks. Um, 
As far as uh, if this is a successful or is it, we're going to build a fleet of DART uh, spacecraft or something like that, uh, well, this is just the first test of a technique to divert an asteroid. Uh, we want to test other techniques. Uh, I mentioned the gravity tractor and some other things uh, earlier. Uh, but also, I, I, as I mentioned, uh, an asteroid impact, a threatening asteroid, is uh, a quite rare event. Uh, we don't know when the next one is going to be, which is why we have to be looking for them uh, to determine that. Uh, but our strategy is to uh, find that population out there with a mission like uh, NEO Surveyor and know where all the potential hazards are uh, and then have, uh, uh, you know, sufficient time uh, to then build the right, uh, uh, actually, campaign of missions to go out there. One of the first missions we would probably do is what we call a characterization mission, send the spacecraft out for at least a rapid flyby. Uh, of the asteroid so we get a really good idea of what it is we're dealing with so we're not having to do like DART is and not even see its target until almost before it hits it. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, be able to decide what is going to be the best technique to use uh, against this asteroid. Uh, uh, so uh, no, we won't have a standing fleet of, of DART spacecraft besides, uh, you know, when the next threat uh, comes, uh, technology will probably have moved on in, you know, 30, 40 years from now. Who can imagine what technology we might have available to deflect an asteroid? Great. Thank you. We will move on to the next question. The next question is from Sabrina Ortiz from ZDNet. Your line is open. Thank you so much. Um, just to clarify, will there be two live stream events that the public can watch, and are they happening at the same time? So the Draco images on NASA TV, and um, will the live video be on nasa.gov that live? And if both of them are happening at the same time, which would you recommend me tune into? All right, uh, let me clarify. Uh, both are on actually on NASA TV. Uh, however, one is on the media channel, so the the quiet live feed of the Draco camera is starting at 5 p.m., 5.30 p.m., I'm sorry, and it will be on, on our NASA media channel. Uh, the broadcast starts at 6 p.m., goes till 8 p.m. Did I get that right? No, 7.30, I'm sorry goes to 7.30, uh, and it is also on NASA TV. I just gave the URL, which is nice and simple to find, which is nasa.gov slash live. And I can't tell you which one to watch, except we're putting a lot, a lot of work into that broadcast, and I know it's going to be great. So that's my suggestion. Uh, and we will have that imagery from the Draco camera as part of that broadcast as well, so you get a, a twofer by watching the broadcast. All right, we'll go to the next question. The next question is from John Kelvey from The Independent. Your line is open. Hey, great. Thank you very much. Um, you did hit on some of these elements, but I was hoping we could kind of bring the threads together. Uh, I presume that if there were a threatening asteroid right now, you wouldn't feel confident building just a scaled-up dart to do a deflection mission. So what are some of the specific things you'd like to learn from dart that would, you know, leave you with the confidence to make a kinetic impact mission that could actually um, deflect a, an asteroid really threatening Earth. And are there any already known limitations on that? For instance, is that not the route you would use to deflect, say, a comet, but you would a smaller asteroid? Thank you. Uh, let me try to answer real quickly part of that question, and that is uh, about the, uh, the spacecraft, the spacecraft operations and such. Uh, a DART, of, you know, will demonstrate uh, the technology that uh, could be used, uh, the uh, autonomous uh, navigation capability, uh, sm smart nav, and and having uh, a, uh, a, a camera uh, like Draco on board. Uh, so the sort of the end-to-end -end system of uh, uh, the spacecraft. Uh, uh, will give us confidence that uh, a, such a spacecraft uh, could be built if there were uh, a threatening asteroid uh, 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 discovered. Uh, uh, the rest of your uh, question is sort of dependent upon the, the characterizations of an asteroid. I don't know, Tom, if you want to uh, add anything uh, about that. Uh, uh, get, you know, uh, we do need to learn more about the population of asteroids out there. 
Yeah, I can take a little bit of that. Of that, I mean, yes, we need to know more about the populations, and so this is where the uh, where any O surveyor will be tremendously important, not just to find that population, to understand what is the range of different properties. As far as the DART outcome goes, I know that one of the things that I would like to know is, is the outcome from the DART experiment in line with what we expected on physical grounds, on simulation grounds? beforehand because um, if it turns out that our expectations for how a solid object would behave, for example, ends up being very much in line with the way a real asteroid behaves, that means our physics is pretty good and we can use that to predict how what we would do in a new situation. On the other hand, if the asteroid responds to the DART impact in a way that's totally unexpected, that might actually send us back to reconsider whether, uh, to what extent kinetic impact is really generally uh, usable. So we, we expect, we certainly hope to be, we hope to learn as much as we can. And being surprised is a good thing because that's when you learn stuff, when your, your expectations are not met. So the DART experiment's going to be very exciting. As a scientist, I fully hope to be surprised by the results of the experiment, although as a planetary defender, I don't want to be too surprised. Yeah, so I'll add just one more thing. There have been a lot of lessons learned for DART and for the operations team of how we would actually operate a mission like this, because um, the way it was designed was that it had a lot of other technologies demonstrating as well, and we would really design it for the kinetic impact in a way where we have many more guidance and control sensors that would be able to tell us more about the system. We would not have large floppy arrays because we want to keep the spacecraft as lean and as trim as possible. Also, um, we might want to go faster uh, instead of bringing more mass. So these are all different things that you would have to study depending on what you want to do for a real. All right, thank you. We have two more questions. I'm going to take one more on the phone line, and then we'll take one in the room. So phone line, next question. Thank you. And the last question is from Sarah Lang from Christian Science Monitor. Your line is open. Hi. I'd like to ask, and this can be for anyone, um, you to articulate what feels the most innovative about this approach to NASA scientists, I mean, being the first planetary defense mission that's been conducted. And does it open the door for future opportunities within this field? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of the layperson of the group here. So um, the thing I found the most interesting is just the test itself. So if, if you just went and hit an asteroid out just out in space, you, you'd hit it, you'd change its velocity by 1%. But the problem is, is with the trajectory and what we know about that asteroid, the, the the, the uncertainty is so great that you would not be able to measure that 1%. Being, you know, the unique thing about this approach is the moon. You know, the, you've, you've, you've got a moon asteroid around a bigger asteroid. You can measure the period of the asteroid very precisely. And we're like 11 hours and 55 minutes. And you, and you can get that looking at light curves. And um, and then you hit it, you change its you change its velocity, you change its orbit period. By you know we think we're going to change it about 10 minutes. Our, our requirement's about 73 seconds, but we actually think we're going to uh, change it by about 10 minutes. Looking at the light curve, you can measure that very precisely. And so it's just the whole unique aspect of of this this whole test that is to me it's like just. When I first heard about it, and I, I knew about the errors, error bars on the asteroids and their orbits, and then I heard the whole moon approach, I thought it was brilliant. Great, thank you so much. Oh, you want to add more? Tom Statler? More. This is Tom. Uh, let me go after the, the, the broader picture of how it's innovative, because we haven't had an opportunity to say that yet. Um, we are moving an asteroid. We are changing the motion of a natural celestial body in space. Humanity, humanity has never done that before. And this is stuff of science fiction books and really corny episodes of Star Trek from when I was a kid. And now it's real. And uh, that, that's kind of astonishing that we are actually doing that and, and what that bodes for the future uh, of what we can do 
uh, and as well as our discussions of, of what as humanity we should do. Uh, it opens up a, a, an amazing fr uh, frontier that is very exciting. And also just how exciting it is for the public, right? To be able to, un here's a mission that you can really get behind and really can understand very easily and just how fun it is to move an asteroid in space. All right, we're gonna end with one last question in the room, if you'd identify yourself too, please. Hi, I'm Zach Savitsky from Science Magazine. Um, Tom, just following up on your answer from previous, um, do you have any, or can you elaborate on how NEO Surveyor could tell us about the internal structure and composition of potentially hazardous asteroids? And are there any plans for doing that sort of assessment prior to future kinetic impacts? So NEO, NEO Surveyor would give us part of the story because NEO Surveyor, when it flies, will give us the ability to, first of all, find lots of objects, and, and secondly, measure their sizes directly, which we haven't had an opportunity to do. And you combine that with regular optical telescope data, then you very quickly get the distribution of, of reflectivities for, for all of these objects. So you get immediately a survey of sort of different mineralogical types in a very, very rough way. Then, uh, if you're ever in a situation where you need to um, where you need to respond to a dangerous object, the most important thing you would need to know would be the mass. Now, if we have, by that time, also really good information from other missions on how mineralogical types correspond with density, then knowing the density and the volume, the size gives you mass, and maybe that helps you respond in a way that may not be quite so reliant on sending a reconnaissance flyby, for example. But every piece of information is a is a partial step to where you really want to be, but uh, and but it's it's definitely a contributor, even though it wouldn't be the answer to all of our questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. We are going to wrap up at this point. If there was a question you didn't get answered, please feel free to uh, reach out to our press team here at NASA headquarters and we will get you an answer. And in the meantime, uh, get ready to watch our show at uh, Monday evening at 6 o'clock on nasa.gov slash live. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, we will continue to have updates about imagery at nasa.gov slash dart after that. So both of those URLs are the places to keep informed. And thank you so much. Looking forward to Monday. Thanks.